Before we move to the next session, there are people we'd like to thank. Thanks to our, Airtel sponsor, uh, to our title sponsor, Airtel, our principal sponsor, SR, without whose support this event would not have been possible. Thanks to Shivas, Mahindra, Alchemist, SRM uh, University, AdGel, BHEL, Adani, Torrent, Monet, Goa Tourism, and Universal Power. A very special thanks to our hospitality and music sponsors, JSW, Star Hero, 100 Pipers, Coca-Cola, Lanco, Reheja Developers, and Rico BIP. Thanks to our session sponsors, United Phosphorus Limited, Mahagun, Louis Philippe, and PC Jeweler. And a very special thanks to our broadcast partner, NDTV. And now we're going to move to a session that is probably going to have a lot of resonance for all of us here. Two years ago, the revolution at Tahir Square captured global imagination and sent cascading effects rippling through the world. It was a very exhilarating moment. But the aftermath of the revolution brought darker times, a, a more muddied circumstance, as ultra-Islamist parties across the Arab region swept into the vacuums that were created by the fallen dictatorships. In a really crushing betrayal of the women who fought at Tahir Square at the front lines, braving police batons and, and camel-riding thugs, in the run-up to the Egyptian election, the ultra-conservative uh, uh, party, a Salafi party called Al Noor, put, instead of the women faces, the candidates, women candidates' faces, they put flowers because they felt that the women's faces should not be seen. And that was really a sim symbol of everything that is going wrong with the Arab revolutions. But now there is another movement afoot. Women across the Arab region are rising up in arms. They're rising to finish the revolution that the men began. And in a wonderful subversion, they're saying there can be no spring without flowers. To talk about this new movement, to talk about the muddied aftermath of the revolution, we have an absolutely wonderful speaker today called Mona El Tawi. She is an icon of the social media. She's a revolutionary herself and a very outspoken feminist. She is completely confusing both the left and the right, and no one knows what to make of her. So please welcome Mona El Tawi. You're one of the first few who started saying that this was only half a revolution. Why did you say that? And when did you first start experiencing the disappointments of the Arab revolution? Oh, I have to start off by saying, first of all, that I'm, I'm an extreme optimist. I'm, I'm a fundamentalist optimist. And, but I think the moment where I realized that this revolution that began basically with a man who set himself on fire in Tunisia had to be completed by women or else it's not a revolution was on March 9th when the Egyptian military uh, broke up the protests. So this is now after Mubarak's resignation. He resigned on February the 11th, but protests continued in Tahrir Square because people understood that a military junta was moving into place, and this is not what our revolution was about. And that military junta sent in soldiers to break up the protests in Tahrir Square, and they took many of the revolutionaries into the Egyptian museum, which is a horrible irony, because you know this is a symbol of our wonderful civilization. They took them into the museum and then into a military jail where they tortured most of, of the, the revolutionaries. But more horrifically for many of us, they subjected female revolutionaries to so-called virginity tests, which are essentially sexual assaults. 
And they claimed that this was so that the women wouldn't say then that they had been raped, as if only a virgin could be raped. And, you know, we saw this happening, and the first woman to speak about this was a, an incredibly courageous revolutionary called Salwa al-Husseini. Because she comes from a working-class background, and because she was a hairdresser, and this is a, you know, a, a job that isn't well-respected in Egypt, when she spoke out, nobody believed her. They said, you're a liar, you're maligning our, our armed forces, these are our heroes, they would never do that. She very, very courageously gave testimony at the journalism union. You know, visibly, everyone could see who she was. And she withstood these accusations of being a liar for months until another young woman came out and made similar accusations called Samira Ibrahim. Now, these are women in their 20s. They come from very, very simple working class backgrounds in Egypt. The difference between Samira and Salwa is that Samira had identification papers so she could sue the regime. So she did. She found a human rights lawyer who helped her to sue the military junta. And all this time I thought, you know, we're going to have mass protests in the street because how dare they violate our revolutionaries like this. But nothing happened. And then we would hear about, you know, more and more stories about women being attacked in Tahrir Square and the rhetoric of these groups that you mentioned who are coming up and moving into the space that we, the revolution, had created, and yet, you know, incredibly, being incredibly insulting to women. And I kept waiting, I kept waiting, I was like, where is the, 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 the new revolution, basically, to defend women's rights? You know, when, when the outrage came, it came when a young blogger called uh, uh, Alia, El, uh, what's her name? Alia El Mahdi. And what, what she did, what Alia did was, she took off her clothes and she took a picture of herself, nude, in her parents' living room and put it on her blog. And the world fell apart. How dare you pose news and how dare you put your... And I'm sitting there going, what? <laughs> this woman has chosen to pose nude and put her picture on her blog. And these revolutionaries were sexually violated by the military junta. This, this is back to front, this is upside down. Mona, we'll come back to this, you know, terrible hypocrisy that, uh, you know, and, and the way women's bodies and women's sexuality becomes the trading chip between, you know, differing political uh, vested interests. But before that, would you share with the audience what happened to you at Tahir Square? You know, mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you very eloquently said that you went to Muhammad Street to touch courage mm -hmm. and you, you ended up facing something quite different. So could you just share that with us? Sure. During the actual 18 days, or well, the revolution continues for me. So it, for many of us, the revolution is definitely not over. So I never say the revolution began and ended. But during the 18 days that most of you were following on, on TV, I was not in Egypt. I was in New York. I was basically living on TV because I was doing a lot of media appearances, doing what I call a media revolution, just to, to impress upon people what, what an exciting and incredible moment this was. Because a lot of people doubted that we could do this. A, lo a lot of people doubted that Arabs, even though I don't like the term Arabs, but we, the people of the Middle East and North Africa, were capable of freeing ourselves from tyranny. Five US administrations supported our dictator. The European Union and so many other so-called Western powers supported our dictator because they believed that we, the people of the region, wanted the strong-fisted pharaoh and the iron-fisted I don't know what, and that was all obviously to justify the fact that they wanted someone to keep that region stable, to keep business deals going, to keep the oil going, to keep the peace with Israel going, all, of, all at our expense. So that, that for me was, you know, the beginning of a very exciting moment. And I first went back to Egypt in July for a sit-in in Tahrir Square at the time. And then in November, so almost exactly a year ago, it, it actually started on November the 19th, the military and the police very violently broke up protests in Tahrir Square, and at the time I was in Morocco speaking at a conference. And I was supposed to go to Brussels to speak at a conference there at the European Union on women in the revolution. But in following what was happening in Tahrir Square, I realized that it was impossible. I couldn't concentrate on anything. So I canceled the trip and I went to Cairo to go to clashes that were happening between the revolution and the military and the police on a street called Mohammed Mahmoud. Now, this street for me was very personal or had a lot of personal significance because I went to the American University in Cairo and the main gate was on this street. So it was the night of November the 22nd. So it was the day before Thanksgiving in the US. And I went with an activist friend of mine to where the clashes were taking place, and we were entrapped by plainclothes security. We thought they were with us. They trapped us in a shop. Well, first we got to the front lines of the clashes, and, the, and they started shooting at us. So these plainclothes security people claimed that if we stayed in a shop with them, we would be safe. And in that shop, they, they 
surrounded us until the, the riot police came. The riot police took my friend. I thought he managed to escape, but they put him in a place where they beat him and he could see them doing the same to me. So I was surrounded by about four or five riot police and they beat me with their nightsticks until they broke my left arm and my right hand in two places. And then they took me to a no man's land between our front line and the security front line. And there they sexually assaulted me. And I, I speak about this a lot because I believe that when we don't speak about sexual assault, the shame remains on the woman and I have no shame. The shame is not mine. The shame is theirs. Thank you. Thank you. So there they sexually assaulted me. I had hands all over my body, hands on my breasts, hands on my genitals. I was taking hands out of my trousers. And at one point, I fell to the ground. And you all remember that iconic picture of the woman being stomped on. She was stripped down to her underwear and the soldiers were stomping on her chest. At one point, I fell to the ground and I was eye level with their boots. And some, some voice inside me said, if, if you don't get up now, you will die. And I don't know how I got up, because if I didn't get up, they would have stomped on my chest just as they stomped on hers. Then they dragged me to the interior ministry where their supervising officer claimed that he would now protect me. Now, this is the same supervising officer that gives them instructions and orders to go out and sexually violate us, and he's going to protect me. Of course he didn't, he threatened me with gang rape. And I was detained for six hours in the interior ministry and six hours in military intelligence. During the first three hours in, in the interior ministry, I didn't have my smartphone. And some of you might know that I tweet obsessively. I lost my phone while they were beating me, and I didn't, ha I didn't have a phone for the first three hours. But then an activist came to try to negotiate a truce between the security and the revolution, or the revolutionaries. And by that stage, they weren't paying too much attention to me, so I asked him to get me on Twitter. Because when you live on Twitter all day, and then there's radio silence, people wonder where you are, and I, and I wanted people to know where I was. So I got on Twitter, and I tweeted, beat and arrested interior ministry. And literally 10 seconds later, his phone died. I don't know what would have happened to me if I hadn't been able to get that tweet out. But I do know, because I found that I was told afterwards that within 15 minutes, hashtag free Mona was trending globally. Al Jazeera and The Guardian had reported that I was detained, and the State Department, because I'm an Egyptian-American, I'm a dual citizen, tweeted back to me that we're onto this. Now, as horrific as all of this is, and I was in detention for 12 hours, I'm incredibly lucky. First of all, people know who I am. Second of all, I got onto Twitter and I got the message out. Third, I'm a dual citizen, and so there was tremendous effort that went into releasing me. If I was an ordinary Egyptian woman that nobody knew, I would probably be dead and not here today. So, I mentioned at the beginning that I'm, I'm an optimist, I'm an extreme optimist. I'm now, I call myself an optimist with consequence, because I know what the consequence of revolution and activism is. But I'm incredibly lucky. And when I was listening to Fawzia Kafur yesterday, when she was telling you that, you know, despite all of these challenges, I'm very lucky and women have it worse, she's absolutely right. No one has tried to assassinate me. <laughs> she's, she's a different level of, of hardship. But despite the broken limbs, despite the sexual assault, I'm incredibly lucky. And so I tell this story over and over again to remind people, first of all, of, of the brutality that this rev our revolution started because of this brutality, to fight this brutality, and it continues to this day, even though we have a new president. But I, I, say that, I tell this story over and over again to remind everybody that there are millions of people that you have no idea about who suffer much worse than me. And because of the privilege that we have, we are obliged tenfold to remind people of those that you don't see. <laughs> Thank you. Mona, it's an it's a awkward time because one aspect of democracy is that people will express themselves. Yeah. And as uncomfortable as everyone is with the fundamentalist forces that are sweeping across the Arab region, that also is a function of democracy because they've been voted into power. Mm -hmm. And the constitutions they're writing, for instance, in Egypt, mm -hmm. I think they've reduced the marriage age. Uh, they want to. They want to, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, the, the one in uh, the draft constitution yeah. that's in process. Uh, I think in Tunisia, a woman was raped and she ended up being, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, the aggressor or, or the one at fault. Mm -hmm. But isn't it a riddle of democracy that if they are being voted into power, then that is the will of the people? Mm -hmm. And yet, 
the base level of democracy is enshrining individual rights, mm -hmm. whereas Islamist parties mm -hmm. would always uh, privilege religion and community. Yes. How do you read this cocktail and, and right. what's the way out of it? Right. Well, I mean, it, it's important to understand, and I'm sure, you know, Indians and everyone else understands that democracy is much more than just putting a piece of paper in a ballot box. Democracy is about the institutions that support that kind of vote, that give you a free and fair choice about so many things. And it's very important to understand that after 60 years of military rule in Egypt, and the military is still incredibly powerful, it's, it's not gone in Egypt, but after 60 years of suffocating and just sucking out the political life in Egypt, it was intended to leave us with just two choices, and those two choices were basically the regime or the Islamists, because they could not, the, the military rule, or the military rulers, Mubarak turned Egypt into both a police and a military state. He could not close the mosque. The majority of Egyptians are Muslim. And so the most organized opposition to his rule was religiously based. But I, I want to also remind everybody that in the first round of our presidential elections, we had 11 candidates. And if you put together the votes that went to the Islamist candidates, there was one from the Muslim Brotherhood, who's now our current president, and there was one who was in the Muslim Brotherhood, but they kicked him out last year when he first said, I'm going to run for president. And last year, they claimed they didn't want to run for president. And that's one of the many, many things that the Muslim Brotherhood have said and then gone back on. Anyway, if you put those two men together, despite the fact that the one who was kicked out from the Muslim Brotherhood didn't run on a strictly Islamist platform, but let's assume that he still is an Islamist, they got less than 48% of the vote, which says to me that the majority of Egyptians do not want religion and politics mixed together. Some of them voted for a socialist candidate who came third. Some of them voted for the candidate of the military junta who came second, and then there were other. So it's very important to hear, because the narrative that you hear and that you see in most media coverage coming out of the Middle East and North Africa is that we just want religion that the only way that we see ourselves is through religion, and it's simply not true. But what we have to do now is we have to use the next few years to establish the alternatives that we were denied by this regime. But it's also important to understand that these same groups now, the Salafis you mentioned, who won't put a woman's picture on their, their leaflets for, for the elections, before the revolution, they believed that it was a sin to rise up against even a tyrant, because they would say that it's better to live under a tyrant than to create chaos. We, the revolution, created the political space for them, into which now they step and they want to reduce. They think it's okay for a nine-year-old girl. And we're saying over our dead bodies, this revolution is not about religion. This revolution is not about nine-year-old girls getting married. This revolution is not about erasing women and putting flowers instead of their faces. This revolution, the chants of the revolution were bread, liberty, and social justice. We rose up against the military and Mubarak for freedom and dignity, not so that some man who is basically a pedophile can in, enshrine in our revolutionary constitution that a child can get married. This is not the revolution. One quick more question, Mona, before I wanted you to share some more personal stuff with our audience. Do you believe that the exercise of power, the very function of being in government, mm -hmm. will moderate the Muslim Brotherhood? Mm -hmm. And, you know, unfortunately, we don't have Ibrahim yeah. Hodabi, who was supposed to come. Uh, he's from the Muslim Brotherhood, and his grandfather and his great-grandfather have been the absolute, uh, you know, supreme custodians of the Muslim Brotherhood. But Ibrahim, who hasn't been able to come, who's been very ill, uh, has now uh, turned his back and repudiated the Brotherhood. And it would have been fascinating to hear why he's done that. But Mona, can you share with us that why are young men mm -hmm. beginning to leave the Muslim Brotherhood, one? Right. And two, do you think the function of power mm -hmm. will moderate them and centralize them right. uh, you know, in the years to come? I'm actually very happy in a, in a twisted kind of way that our current president is from the Muslim Brotherhood because I want the Muslim Brotherhood to own this mess. Because whoever would have been our president would have had to own this mess. It's impossible to fix everything in less than two years after a revolution begins. But it's also important to see that the, the Muslim Brotherhood was an ideological movement. Once an ideological movement moves into politics, it becomes tainted with politics. It comes down to earth with the rest of us, and it has to make compromises. And what you see happening now with our current president, Mohamed Morsi, is that he stepped into this supposed central space that Mubarak left. But in doing so, his conservative constituents and the Salafis, who erase women's faces and put flowers in their place, they are now calling him a sellout. And so the, my concern, or the concern of many of us, is that he's going to cede the right wing 
to these ultra-conservatives. But while he's doing that, he's not ceding... The, so this is the social right wing now. He's not ceding the economic left wing to those of us on the revolution who want social justice. So if you're going to cede the right wing to them because you want to place yourself in the middle, at least cede the, eco the economics of what we're doing now to try to achieve so social justice, and he's not doing that. So I think what, what's happening now is that people recognize that the Muslim Brotherhood are not f capable of being these politicians because for the longest time, their platform was Islam is the solution, with very little idea of what that means. And that actually takes me to, to answer your question about why young people were leaving the Brotherhood. This began to become noticeable in 2007, 2008, when the Brotherhood first, because after years of saying Islam is the solution, Islam is the solution, they, they were launched in 1928. We kept asking them, what does that mean? What does that mean for foreign policy? What does that mean for the environment? What does that mean for education? So they issued a draft platform at the end of 2007. And the most contentious point, contentious point in that draft platform was that women and Christians, and we have a sizable Christian community in Egypt, women and Christians could not be president. How is such a movement considered democratic? I have no idea. But when they said this, young men like Ibrahim Hudaybi, who I admire greatly, they said, this is 2008. You can't say women and Christians can't be presidents. And they got into this huge internal struggle. And a lot of the struggle was actually happening online. Because you have to look at the Muslim Brotherhood as a, a microcosm of the state. We had Mubarak, who was our like, supreme guide. They had their supreme guide. And just as Mubarak and the rule went top bottom, the supreme guide's rule in the Muslim Brotherhood goes top bottom. So you saw a lot of young people rising up against Mubarak in the streets that culminated in the January 25th uprising that led to the revolution. This kind of struggle is also happening in the Muslim Brotherhood. And Ibrahim al-Hudaybi and other young men and women who became very frustrated at the ceiling they kept hitting, they began to leave the Muslim Brotherhood because they were given, the, they were given this choice. They were told, stop blogging and stop criticizing or leave. And so they chose to leave. And cheers to that. You know, I, that I want that. all of them to leave. I want a revolution that makes the movement itself to recognize you can't have this top-bottom uh, dictatorship anymore. That's, that's what's happening in Egypt. Mona, we're very quickly going to run out of time. So, you know, you were telling me over lunch yesterday that you yourself used to wear a scarf mm -hmm. for many years and it took you 11 years to take it off. It was eight. But yes. Eight years <laughs> to take it off. And that... Um, you feel that you've been fighting jails all your life and you still have some jails left to fight. Mm -hmm. So what made you a feminist? What made you want to take the scarf off? Right. Well, I was born in Egypt and my family moved to London when I was seven. And I, and I was telling Shoma, oh, I think it was over breakfast a few days ago, that when, when my family moved to London, my parents are both doctors and they went there to do their PhDs. But as a child, I was already picking up sim, like, you know, small signs of just how little people expected from Muslim women. My teachers at school would be shocked when I told them that my mother and my father are in London to do PhDs in medicine. You know, your mother's doing a PhD. And then at 15, we moved to Saudi Arabia for the beginning of the worst six years of my life. And, and I, I joke, but it's very serious actually, that as a female in Saudi Arabia, you have two options. You lose your mind or you become a feminist. And at first, I began to lose my mind. <laughs> And at first, I seriously did begin to lose my mind. I fell into a deep, deep depression because I just could not understand what was happening. And then I became a feminist. And, and this feminism saved my mind because I, I began to read the literature of amazing Muslim women writers like Fatima Mernisi from Morocco, like Nawal Sadawi, even though she doesn't identify overtly as Muslim, but she comes from a Muslim background, like so many other women who were basically saying, this is wrong. What happens in Saudi Arabia is not the Islam that I know. And so I became, I, I say I was traumatized into feminism. I chose to wear, wear a headscarf at the age of 16, and I continued to wear it for nine years, but I recognize now that it took me eight years to take it off. It's very easy to choose to wear it, but very difficult to choose to take it off. Now, most, family, most female members of my family wear headscarves, and I respect it as long as it's out of choice. But when we talk about choice, we also have to talk about the, the choice to reverse that choice. And it's often very difficult because of how conservative our cultures or our societies over the past few decades have become. Mona, you recently shocked both the right and the left when in America, in the subway, you took some pink paint and you sprayed an offensive photograph, uh, you know, which was decrying uh, Muslims as being an inferior race. Mm -hmm. uh, can, you, can you talk about the reactions to that? Why were your friends appalled by what you did? 
Sure. Um, this is an ad that was put up in 10 subway stations in New York, and it was an ad paid for by a notorious racist and bigot called Pamela Geller. And we've, we've known about Pamela Geller for a long time in New York, and we fought her racism and bigotry. The ad said, in the war between the civilized man and the savage, always choose the civilized man, support Israel, defend jihad. And I read about this ad, and I'm going to curse, so excuse me, and I thought, what the fuck? <laughs> There's no way. I could not believe this ad. And, and this is not something that was online, that was then taken out, like that film that drove so many people crazy. No, no, this was something in real life. It was in your face, in the subway, in Times Square, on 49th Street, on so many subway stations. And people were just arguing about it on Twitter. Now, Twitter saved my life. I, I told you what happened when I tweeted. But there are times when you need to leave this small room called Twitter, and you need to get out in the real world and confront. And I could not just sit on Twitter and just whine and complain about racism. It's not a crime to be a racist. I don't want to make racism and bigotry a crime, and hate speech in the United States is protected. I love the First Amendment. I don't want to criminalize hate speech. What I want to do is make racism and bigotry socially unacceptable. You can be the racist all you want, but I'm going to get out there in the real world and make your life hell because racism is wrong. And so when I, when I heard about this ad, I went and bought a can of pink, pink spray. Pink because I love my nieces and they love pink. And it's not a kind of, you know, little kind of girl, girly pink. They, they, these are fierce little girls. One is four and one is nine, and they will kick your ass. They're tiny, but they will kick your ass. And so I love pink because of them, but I also wanted a see-through color that was the least violent, because what I wanted to do was show, I didn't want to erase the words, I wanted the words to remain, because if that's protected speech, I believe in the right to offend, but, but I also believe in the right to peacefully protest that offense. So I went fully intending to spray the, the, the graffiti with the word racist, racist on it, I don't know how many people here know how to tag, but it's very difficult. As soon as I started spraying, I realized that I could not do it. <laughs> so I just thought, okay, it's just gonna be just pink fuzz. But there was media at the station and there was someone from the group that put up the ad, and, and I got this woman from the group that put up the ad, put herself between me and the ad, and we got into an altercation, and I didn't wanna touch her because I didn't want assault charges. But I was arrested and charged with criminal mischief, making graffiti in possession of a graffiti instrument. Now, the reason that some of my friends, as Shoma said, were upset, because they said that it made you look bad and vandalism puts people off. And I thought, you know what, I don't care that I look bad, because you have to go out there, as I said, and confront racism. But if vandalism puts people off and upsets them more than racism and bigotry, then my God, we're in trouble in America. How can people not be more upset about racism and, and bigotry than vandalism? And, you know, I, I said I'm an Egyptian-American. As a citizen of the United States, I know that I can draw on a long and proud history of civil disobedience, the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement, all of them, every single Pro, uh, progress or step in the right direction in the United States has had the way paved for it by nonviolent civil disobedience. So I broke the law. I don't care because racism and bigotry are wrong. And I will continue to go out there and do it nonviolently because I feel today, as a Muslim in the United States, that Muslims are one of the few groups left against whom it's okay to be racist and it's okay to be bigotry. And I use the word racist because everyone assumes Muslims are brown. Of course, Muslims are from different ethnic backgrounds, but when you use a word like savage in that ad, you have to remember Native Americans and the genocide of, of Native Americans and how the word savage was used to justify the slavery of West Africans to various parts of the world. So those friends of mine who were upset, you know, they said, you know, you shouldn't have broken the law. My argument with them is there are moments where you have to break the law out of principle, and there are moments when you have to go out in the real world and engage with hatred and hate speech and tell it, I will be after you, until I make this socially unacceptable. I was just going to ask you an ultimate question, but the bell has rung. So we, we'll have to leave it at that. Uh, another interesting thing I would have last, liked to ask Mona is that, uh, you know, she often feels that the social media uh, is, is a limited world and you know we have to get out there in the real world and, and do it and that was something that we, we could have talked a little more about. I don't know if you've been reading the quotes at the back but uh, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that there is now a new website called the, the 
the rising of the women in the Arab world. And there are over 35,000 women and men who've put their photographs and who have put their words to say that they are going to fight the kind of hege hegemonic, religious, and patriarchal structures that is squeezing the world down. And it's interesting that whether it's in Afghanistan or whether it's in Pakistan or in India or in Egypt or indeed in America, that the unfinished project of the human race is now being taken up by women. And I think that when we accomplish that, we will arrive at a more egalitarian world. Sure, Thank I, you for can, listening. Can I add something very quickly? I, I forgot to add something that's important to the, to the protest that, that I, I talked about. Five days after I was arrested for spray painting this ad, my brother's local mosque was set on fire. This was the third time that a mosque was set on fire in two months. And, and I, I wanted to mention this because it's important to connect the dots between hate speech and hate crime. And the man who set this mosque on fire is now standing trial. Those nieces that I mentioned who love pink, my nieces and nephews were in that same mosque on that Sunday, in Sunday school, just a few hours before this man set their mosque on fire. So this is why, to take the social media question, this is why you must get off Twitter and get in the real world and fight. Thank you. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, Sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners. We shall Thank you.